Well, Catherine, welcome to the Science of Psychotherapy podcast. It's so great to have you with us. Thank you very much for inviting me. <laughs> great pleasure. It's Richard here. You're, you're, I'm the one you've been emailing with a bit because we talked about your chapter, which I'll talk about a bit later, which is going in the magazine. Now, Catherine, before we dive into uh, your latest book and all of those details, you've got a bit of an interesting background. You didn't always, uh, you weren't always in this space of psychotherapy, um, but you've come from um, the biological sciences. Can you give us a bit of background? Um, yes, I, I originally um, went to university in Switzerland, where I come from, and I, I originally did chemistry, so I had the I then specialized in biochemistry. So I have a PhD in biochemistry and um, worked as a postdoc. And that's how I came to Cambridge, UK, because that's like the mecca for biochemists. And um, it was whilst being here that I then retrained as a psychotherapist. What was um, the motivation for the, for the jump across to psychotherapy? Well, I think... There were multiple reasons, some of them more embarrassing than others, but um, I could say that I that I decided that actually a, I preferred a more subjective point of view of of, of looking at people than the, than this objective scientific one, or I could say that I thought people were more interesting than molecules. Um, it, it's absolutely that. understandable. My, my yes. mentor, Ernest Rossi, who's uh, been a marvellous uh, investigator on, on so many levels, he, he, he got his early degrees in pharmacy. Uh, and then shifted this, just like you. He said uh, uh, exactly. His parents were very annoyed that he didn't set up a pharmacy shop and earn them a bit of money. But um, that's a, it's a very interesting thing. Uh, Dan Siegel also was doing medicine, and uh, so you're in a you're in a very uh, interesting group of people who say I think uh, human beings have got something more interesting about them. Yes, like and I would say it comes with advantages and disadvantages. So. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of my life trying to, to sort of bring these two halves of my life together. And the, the, my first book, Anatomy and Physiology for Psychotherapist, was one such attempt. And by now I've moved a bit further and I'm, I'm a psychotherapist who has a, a liking for research and, and a little bit of understanding of how neuroscience might work. Oh, yes, you're our, you're our kind of people, aren't you, Matt? Absolutely. We love the biological sciences and the neurosciences and how that all fits together with psychotherapy. Now, your book, Emotional Neglect and the Adult in Therapy, Lifelong Consequences to a Lack of Early Attunement. How should we uh, how should we approach this, Richard? Yes, well, I'm, I'm, I mean, for me, I think it's very interesting because what, what interests me and perhaps if you can expand personally you uh, would just simply tell the, the own story but I just love this idea of just taking the the approach of early childhood emotional neglect um, and uh, that's such an interesting choice of perspective uh, if you could just expound a bit on that and and how that led you to writing this book it, we, I'd love to hear it Yes, it came very much out of my clinical practice. Um, so I live in Cambridge, which is a very middle class, very educated, generally town. The people who present for psychotherapy are often middle class, very educated, often very highly educated. Um, and for a while, I just seemed to have one client after another who presented with, with this background of, of, of early neglect without actually having experienced much abuse, other trauma. Mm. So it felt like I was getting a picture of what neglect by itself looks like once per people are grown up. And I, you know, I'd struggled to work with these people a lot. So I thought, let's just see what books there are. And I started looking for books. I couldn't find any. Um, I found some self-help books, but no psychotherapy books. And in psychotherapy books, neglect always seems to get be sort of an afterthought of abuse. People say it 
you know, this early abuse and they also neglect, of course. And they neglect it, of but course. Actually, nobody distinguishes the two presentations. And I just started to think, they don't look the same. They look different. So I just, I started to really pay attention to that and, and collect material. And I thought, well, somebody has to start writing something and then maybe other people will chip in with what they know. But I can make a start and put out like state of the art, what I have learned so far from from my own clients, um, who I can never s- cease to be eternally grateful to, because everything I know, I've learned, I know from my clients. Yes, and that's a beautiful thing. We we advocate that a lot. They're the they're the they're the source of of the information, and we're mm-hmm. just the uh, recorders. Now it, it's interesting. I mean. Uh, as I say, and everyone uh, listening, you know, th- this uh, th- the opening chapter is going to be in the next uh, split up over the next two uh, issues of the of the magazine, and uh, uh, the what it, uh, immediately I looked at it, I began to think of attachment issues uh, because I come from that interpersonal neurobiology and uh, uh, you know Dan Siegel and Alan Shaw and things, and you do address this, uh, you know, it, it's. Of course you do. It is quite logical. How's your take on the the interplay between those ideas and uh, this idea that is there a difference? Uh, you know all those various types of questions. Mm. I mean, I you know it seemed to me that it's not really possible nowadays to write a mainstream psychotherapy book without addressing the more neuroscientific stream of of narratives that's coming into therapy. Um, I've always felt very ambivalent about trying to to put neuroscience and psychotherapy together because of course they have such different perspectives. So um, people who, you know, I sometimes read essays or or, um, case histories by, by trainees in psychotherapy and they'll say, well, my, you know, my theoretical background includes object relations theory and neuroscience. And I sort of think, neuroscience is not a psychotherapeutic theory. Huh? What are you talking yeah. about? So, but, but of course we can make use of it. And, and I think certainly the, the field of trauma and also affect regulation, those are the fields where the two are beginning to meet and actually influence each other so that psychotherapy also um, gives the neuroscientists some of the questions that they might want to ask um, and might want to look at and and at the same time the neuroscientists are teaching us stuff about um, how how you know what what it means in terms of a person's nervous system so that's um, I think you know, I've I've come to agree that neuroscience has something to offer, um, and other than just a convenient and politically acceptable narrative. Um, but I, but I, you know, I come from body psychotherapy, so body psychotherapy has actually had um, a bit of a of a head start on other approaches because we've always felt that self regulation was an important thing. Um, and that's always made us into a close allies of, of the whole um, self-regulation field and also of polyvagal theory. So Steve Porges is one of the, the heroes that we really relate to. And I would say perhaps it's the central bit of what I pay attention to is that people who who don't have adequate um affect regulatory relation or attachment bonds uh, in the first period of their lives don't develop a, a proper social engagement system. So the mm. whole ventral vagal mm. complex remains either undeveloped or not well, it just doesn't function properly. And of course, then we can start to speculate the consequences that this has for the whole of a person's life. Yes, yeah. yes. Porges is certainly one of our uh, our favourites. I've I've been fortunate to know him for quite a while, and and it's it just uh, rocked uh, uh, our way of of perceiving the mechanisms that enable us to self regulate, and uh, yeah. uh, and and it's that thing you brought up there about um, uh, about sufficient and insufficient. But Matt, I can see you champing at the bit. So, well, uh, I, I I really want to s- sort of start out with some definitions. So we're talking about emotional neglect. Now that will mean a, a different things to different people, mm. and so um, Catherine, 
can you just give us a, a, a bit of a definition of what you're meaning when you, we talk about emotional neglect? Yes. Um, I can give two definitions. One is the definition of the person who has survived the childhood of emotional neglect. And their definition will be very much a subjective one. So yep. they will feel that ultimately they weren't really seen as a person. They felt... Um, they felt that their needs weren't being met. They felt possibly unwanted, unloved, unwelcomed. Um, and I think it's important to say that doesn't say anything about what the person's upbringing was actually like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, that's and interesting. So, so difficult to pinpoint from an objective perspective. Yes, because, you know, I'm really not in the business of guilt tripping people who are now mm. having children or have or have had children or, or are thinking about having children. I really don't want to do that. So um, in terms of looking at like external events that are easy to pinpoint, because of course, one, you know, I'm aware that one of the reasons that, that there's very little literature on neglect is because it's so difficult to pinpoint. It's mm -hmm. an absence of something. And it's very characteristic of people with, with early emotional neglect that they don't know what's wrong with them. They don't know what happened to them and they haven't got a narrative for what happened. I think that is a part of the presentation and it's serious. It, it's a, it's a, like a hole in the middle of your, your sense of who you are. Um, if you've got that much of a, a gap in your, in your autobiographical self. But then there's also the definition of, of what might have happened to a person that psychotherapists maybe need to look out for. And I think there's things like early loss of caregivers, um, postnatal depression of of the mother, uh, particularly. I mean, if you look at the literature of what's what's out there on postnatal depression, this huge amount of research, it's all about the mothers. None of it's about the children. Almost none of it's about what happens to the children. So, you know, I think it's important to look at that again without wanting to to guilt trip these poor mothers. Um, yes, I think that's what's so beautiful. When when I look at the book, you you in the first chapter you introduce us to four uh, adults who are clients, and as you say, that that we as we are always grateful when they contribute their their stories. Uh, and these, you know, we follow through uh, in, in many in many aspects. But this this total juxtaposition of here you are talking to somebody at various uh, uh, various ages and I think it's Pearl who's a mother herself worried about doing these these very same processes mm -hmm. and um, but you're dealing with so you're dealing with the adults and the babies kind of in the same in the same holding how how I'm not, well, I don't know, how do you manage that you know but it's sort of uh, how is that? Um, uh, made comfortable for you in the in the therapy process. I mean, this is obviously what you put out in the book, but but yeah, we can you give us a bit of an insight. Um, well, I, I you know I have I have the person who's with me in the room or these days on the screen, um, mm. and that's the person whose whose subjective history I'm interested in. I'm really not interested in, or you know. I might have some interest in, in what their parents' version is of what happened, um, but it's it's really not my focus. And in fact, what I often find with people who've been neglected is that they're, they have very, because they're so very insecurely attached, they're very identified with their parents. So I very often get the parents' story long before I get the client's story. Mm. So that you know, it's often like you know I hear somebody say, "Oh well, you know I was a I was a, a a baby who didn't want to, who wasn't very friendly or didn't make much contact." And I sort of think this is, this is a piece of propaganda if I've ever, ever heard one. Yeah. So is it, is it hard for the client themselves to even identify that this is emotional neglect if it's not if 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 they don't see it as overt uh, abuse? Yes, this thing of what's missing is such a hard thing to, mm. to, to grasp yeah, for somebody. It's often very hard, yes. So often years of work before, because the, the, the attachment figures are so so very um, protected often. So I'm, I, it often takes me a very long time to be able, and I, I've sort of learned not to insist on using the words. Um, mm. 
because mm, that, that can just amplify unnecessary uh, yes. uh, attitudes. I was, That's uh, I right. was in- but then for other people, it's helpful to use the words. And for, you know, for some people, it's really helpful if I show them a, a still face experiment video um, and say, look, you know, do, do you think this might be what happened to you? And, and they, they're very grateful because they can then slot themselves in somewhere and, and they can start to think about what happened to them. And for some people, that's very, very healing, very containing. Um, I was intrigued by the the uh, sort of one of the, the uh, indicators. I was they don't like drawing attention to themselves. Yeah. Uh, now that was that was a. Uh, now is that? I mean, obviously there are some people who are like that for various reasons of shyness and so on and so forth. But uh, how does that play into the to the sort of indicating where they're at? Well, I mean, I think it doesn't just come with neglect. It seems to generally come with perinatal trauma. So oh. also people who you may be otherwise securely attached, but like had very early surgery or something like that. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, or it may be a feature of neglect. It's very hard to say. But my sense, I mean, the thing that intrigues me is that it seems like when you don't get looked at with happy, loving, you know, eyes, with with welcoming glances, that that it's like something doesn't develop. Yes. Like a developmental mm. window that's only open very early in life. Um, and then... If, if you miss that, it's very hard to re-establish that. And you may go through life actually repeating what's happened to you, which is that you keep getting overlooked. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and often it, 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 there's a vol- there's a sense of I'm I feel really exposed, I feel very shamed, I don't like being looked at. Um, but it can also then tip into its opposite, whereas I'm mean, why am I always being ignored? Why am I always being overlooked? Mm. Um, and it, it's awful. It's awful for the people yeah. that it's happening to. Now, I, want, I, I want to talk about cultural differences in a minute, but um, but also generational um, differences. Now, you're in England um, during, you know, the Second World War and um, just afterwards. Um, the children that were, you know, born and being brought up at that time, um, I would imagine... Um, that there would probably be a lot more emotional neglect around those very, very difficult times um, than maybe in a more prosperous, uh, peaceful time. Is, do, you, do you see that? Um, it's very hard to know. Mm-hmm. I, you know. I don't work with many people now who were even born during the war. Sure. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. So it's hard to know, but I... I mean, what I've secretly to myself, what I've come to think of is that actually what the thing that matters, apart from the external circumstances, like just like, you know, like if your mother dies when you're born or something, then obviously there's going to be a severe tr- loss there. Hmm. But but actually what makes the quality of feeling not neglected is, is a capacity for concern, if you like, is a mm-hmm. parent being able to see you as a separate person. Right. And uh, right. rather than there's a very not, you know, if the parents are very narcissistic, like an extension of themselves. Um, mm-hmm. And I think yeah. that's changed over the last 50 years or so. And people are now less able to see others as a separate person. So I would say in that sense, it's perfectly well possible that the people who were, you know, very young during the war or born during the war and were pe- perhaps sent away, particularly out of London, um, that those people suffered, you know, severe deprivation, they suffered loss, but actually they knew that their parents sort of held them in mind and thought of them and loved them. Right, Um, yeah, so they were able to... One of the, you know, if I take an example out of literature, the the thing that everybody knows is Harry Potter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, And Harry Potter has has a first year of life, which is great. And and then for the re- for the rest of his life is is absolute wall to wall bad, yeah. There's and, drama. Um, yeah. Yes, and but but he but that foundation he has really carries him through, and he behaves throughout like somebody who's securely attached. Right. Um, 
Yes, and, and she... I think that's not unrealistic. Um, I think I think jo- Joanne Rowling's psychology is good. Mm. So, yes, and she beautifully brings in these regular moments where he finds some engagement with his sense of love, which is what you were just talking about. Absolutely, yeah. Um, this is quite true, uh, quite true indeed. Because the, the, I'm interested in the the uh, just as we draw around to examples, going to the the four that you chose. Um, we've got Mortimer and Norman and Olivia and Pearl, so two two males, two females. Uh, and um, were these uh, particularly selected because of the, the the variation or the differences between or the similarities between? Was there a process in uh, allowing, uh, besides getting them to give you permission, um, was there a process in choosing those four? Um, I mean, they're, they're not real people. Right, they're so they're compilations. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't, I didn't ask anybody for permission, frankly, because I thought, well, I hope nobody will absolutely recognise themselves. Yeah. Or right. everybody who says, oh, I, I remember saying that may will also see that they're, it's sort of packaged in, in completely different biographical details. Oh, great. Because, that's, that's, that's good because it's, it's really important and helpful to, to, that there's a strength, uh, there's a strengthening of the, of the examples um, because sometimes yeah. when you follow a, a case, you sit there and there's sort of six pages you turn over where you think, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that's a bit boring. But, uh, yes. Yeah, you, I, I wasn't interested in that. Um, yeah. They were hard to construct. Right. Um, and, I, I mean, I knew I wanted to have case examples um, but but it was it was quite a task to construct them, and in the end, what I did was that I that I followed very much the 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 sequence of coping strategies that I show in the first chapter. So I I, I sort of show four separate coping strategies, which are perhaps slightly more high functioning one than the other. Well, they're exceptional. They're I exceptionally real. Uh, uh, so. Your construction was excellent. They're beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, are we able to just tease out maybe uh, one or two, um, you know, tips from you about um, speaking to therapists um, about uh, some of the approaches that they they might consider? Mm. That's a very wide question. It is. Yeah. I'm I giving you a lot of scope here. <laughs> yes, yes, you're very yeah. welcome to trim it down into, into your own frame. But just, uh, you know, a couple of the perhaps that elements in the, in that first chapter of the of the natures of, of what you're approaching. So, I mean, uh, you know, I have a lot of people that I supervise and I can tell you the kinds of difficulties that many therapists seem to come across is that oh, yeah. Um, yeah. these may be clients who... Cut. They usually turn up session after session, but you may sit there feeling, I don't know what to do with this person. I'm, I don't know what they're getting out of this, mm-hmm. um, and and feeling quite stuck with that. And I would say, in it's really my experience that that to to confront the client with this is totally unhelpful. Right. And that's because these people very these people usually have a narrative of themselves that although they don't know what happened to them, they only have themselves to blame. Okay. Um, so that- if, if you if you start trying to observe what happens in the therapy room, they'll feel blamed immediately, and and they'll ex- they'll experience that as very shaming, um, and they may bugger off and never come back. So um, I think I think. You know, it, and and it goes in in more general terms. M- nearly all challenges are unhelpful. But I and that's a really important word that one you brought because I know the second half of the first uh, the first chapter is on and highlights this this aspect of shame, uh, and it's a it's a highly um, under. Uh, I think uh, not misunderstood, but under understood um, in people. So. Uh, with some of these shame aspects that they feel, um, is it a, a constant sort of aspect? Is it very quick they fall into shame or sometimes uh, is it slow? Do they have that resilience? Or, of course, is this just the, the variance between individuals as they as they deal with their own experience? I, I would say it's very variable, but 
I I would think that shame is always something to be on the lookout for, and always something to consider when you when you say anything, you know, you could just run a quick check past your own mind. Is this going to be potentially shaming? And be expected to find that you have shamed somebody, even if you didn't intend to, or even if you didn't think you, if even if you thought you were saying something very harmless, it may still have been shamed. The person may still have felt shamed. Um, right. It, I mean, it seems to me obviously people feel deep shame when they feel they're not wanted or there's something wrong with them. Yes. Um, simply because children can't see that if if they're not wanted that that's not to do with them that's not personal as it were children always take everything personal and always look for well what might i be doing differently to make this better okay. um so i you know i suspect that for children to think mm, my parents are just you know not much good and they that you know they're they're just they're just not very nice people kind of thing that doesn't work for a child because I think that the helplessness you're left with at that point is is too overwhelming. So children never think that. Children always think it must be them. And if if you don't feel that somebody wants you, um, that that really must mean there's something very severely wrong with you, and and you can you you feel shame. Okay. But that's only the sort of core or existential shame, and I think shame comes in so many different layers. So the fe feeling exposed that I've talked about before also leaves its own sense of shame. Um, there's a shame that comes from trying to make contact with a caregiver who is not responsive and not meeting anything that create, you know, that's the, the shame where you can look at Colin Trevathan's footage of, of babies who try to do that and then nobody responds. And they're, it's just harrowing the way these children look. Mm. Um, mm. And then there are later layers of shame. So shame is very complex. And um, it seems to me that, you know, whether shame can be processed as part of a of an ordinary kind of experience where you've just embarrassed yourself and you have to say, you know, yeah. all right, <laughs> sorry. So, so, yeah. um, that, you know, to, to totally, totally overwhelming and traumatic shame, there's a wide spectrum and... And mm. how bad shame is for somebody depends on how much they've had to deal with and how early, because, you know, I, at least Alan Shore would, from from reading what he says, I would assume that the capacity to process shame isn't uh, isn't there at birth and isn't there until the second year of life. Yes, so, yes, I would agree with that, yeah. So I if, think he says if that. you feel a lot of shame before then, presumably that's by definition overwhelming. You can't process it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So the therapist who feels stuck and you've made them very aware of the shame aspect and, you know, not to challenge, then what suggestions do you have for them to feel like they're moving in a forward direction? Um, be patient. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> People need, need patience. Um, have good supervision. Right. And, and think, don't think in terms of, of in the conflict of the person, think in terms of deficits, think in terms of what the person needs extra rather than what gets in their way. Yes. Think in terms of what additional resources you might try and help the person build for themselves so that they can construct their own sense of self, if you like, on the broader basis. Um, mm. Mm. Right. Yeah. So that's, maybe that's a main yes, problem. Yes. It's it's the it's the insufficient uh, canvas. You know. It's it's that um, the unfu the unfilled the unfilled canvas. That's that's really nicely uh, described there. And and, mm -hmm. and of course, uh, I mean, uh, Matt and I are asking these questions also just with the assumption that people are going to go out and learn more about the topic, which is what you said very early on. This mm. is something that uh, that we're not. Uh, sensitive to enough. And I can see that a lot of what you're talking about as a therapist is the need for therapist sensitivity to, to what is coming across from the client. It's not just a... I, I think you know, that's true, yes. And I think, you know, one of the one of my intentions was to help people understand what it's like to, to have been an ignored child and 
uh, I think if you if you can bring that understanding to your clients, that is actually also therapeutic mm. because these people have felt so alone in their lives and so um, abandoned, really, in in many ways. That if somebody understands, it's helpful. Yes, yes. So it has a lot to do with emotional attunement, doesn't it? Rather than any sort of rationalization. Yes. Mm. Um, depending on the client, either or both is is, is helpful. Right. Um, mm. I don't know. You know, in terms of helping cl- uh, therapists see what progress they're making, um, this can be hard, and mm. it can be sometimes you don't know for quite for months whether what you're doing is is actually really getting a process forward, or or whether you're just turning in a circle in some traumatic process that doesn't have an ending um so, so I, yeah. I i do think it it's hard to know sometimes and sometimes you but and often you can ask the client sometimes the client knows mm-hmm. yeah um, yeah so uh, are there markers that that uh, we can look out for um what would i use um often the the quality of the relationship changes okay. so that the relationship becomes a bit more dialogic rather than being very very one sided mm-hmm. um so i can think of clients where where i go for years and think i'm you know the client doesn't really know how to make use of me and then suddenly there, there's something suddenly this person said oh i was thinking after the last session when you said this I, right that's it yeah <laughs> or um the client suddenly says, when I last spoke to my mother and suddenly starts to make a link between something that's happening now and the past, stuff like that. This is brilliant. But little, little, just little signs of, of increasing um, or normal attachment relationship. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's very nice. I, I, we, we always love a quite a friend of mine that does a lot of work on single session therapy, the understanding of that, uh, uh, and um, uh, Michael Hoyt in America. And, uh, but he says that quite often when you actually examine a, a series of, of, of treatment, you might find that a dramatic moment, a change moment occurs in one session. So single session therapy has validity. He says, I just can't tell you which session that's going to be. Yes, and, that's and, true. And, and that's the point. And, yeah. and the, when you think in systems theory, of course, we talk about the phase shift, that there is, you know, if, if, if the phase shift is when at, at 99 degrees, when, you know, when water's about to boil, there can be quite a lot of time to, um, to, bring, the, to bring the system up to a point where it's, where it's able to expand out of, uh, out, of, out of whatever it is. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Now, now, do we have an idea of how common emotional neglect is? I'm assuming there's a high correlation with insecure attachment, um, but in, in in your studies, uh, what sort of percentage of the population are we looking at? Um, I honestly have no idea. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's really not my field. No. Uh, I understand from what I hear, like on the street, is that. Still, when when you do adult attachment interviews with with a, broad, a representative sample of the population, fifty percent come up as securely attached. Yeah, the rest yep. will be insecurely attached. Um, and I would have thought, you know, the neglect you mostly find in in um, dismissive attachment and mm-hmm. disorganized. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, I so there's no, there's some percentage of the fifty percent, and uh, yeah, yeah. but uh, but I guess it's that it's that that simple thing that when a therapist is working as you are working, one hundred percent of the people who have neglect uh, that come to your office, you know, have neglect, and it's just discovering, discovering. Yes, and, and some of that is of course my own perceptual filter, but um, yeah. some of it is probably also the pe- the word goes around that I'm good with these clients, so people. People refer them to me. Um, yeah, oh, I would say just just intuitive understanding of not of culture and and people. I would say it's it's very widespread. Yes, I'm, I'm reframing a lot of um, uh, past clients. Actually, I'm just sort of going, "Hello, there you go." Know. Uh, although I was, I'm sure I was terribly sensitive and uh, kind. But this is this is why I was particularly taken by. Um, 
by just the title, and and then we then we moved on, and and we were able to uh, to get a good look at the book. So now the book, I think, is is uh, just out. Is it just out? Uh, the, yes. I think it was the seventeenth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's it's um it's it's crispy fresh. Uh, mm-hmm. At the moment, yes, everybody. I haven't so. even got a copy of it. <laughs> <laughs> you'll you'll have to wait to see. It's very good. <laughs> I've, I've, I've seen it. Thank you. <laughs> well, but, I've, um, I've had the peak of the e version, but <laughs> yeah. Oh, isn't that funny? Authors are authors and, and movie actors. I suppose we never get to see our stuff. So <laughs> that's just out, and there'll be uh, hopefully a, a slew of these of these sorts of interviews for you, just as a sort of a bit of a uh, uh, an interesting um, uh, and a question. How about your own experience? Now you don't need to share, of course. So, did you find, as you did this, when you looked back on your own experience, that you were uh, you were satisfied or unsatisfied, or did it give you some kind of self development um, uh, benefits? Um, it, it probably did some. Yes, I mean, I'm. I guess. You know, if you ask me, was I an ignored child? I would say mm, a tiny little bit, not not very much, enough to be able to extrapolate. Mm, right. But what I would also add is that I had a father who was very ignored. So I grew right. up with an ignored child and right. learned from a very early age how to be with ignored children, which is what I need to be able to do. Um, yeah, so that must have been a fascinating reflection back, saying, oh, wow, Dad was like that, yeah. Oh, yeah, very much, yeah. So I can pick the members of my family who were very ignored and the ones who were not so ignored. And yeah. I can yeah, I can find the the bits in myself that conform to the to the clinical picture and the bits that don't. Um, yeah. yeah, so I'm thinking of something like alexithymia, which is, um, you know, yeah. that that lack of development of emotional um, capacity of self-perception, that this would be one of the frameworks and, I, and uh, you're nodding and <laughs> encouraging yes. me there. Yeah. It, can, it can be very much part of it. And you don't quite know where the difficulty is when you see that, yeah? Whether this is that the person is really not in their body and can't, therefore can't feel themselves or whether they've not learned to put the words together with the feeling. Right. Yes, this this is interesting, Matt. This this yeah. dealing with deficit, um, mm. you know, mm-hmm. finding the things that are not there is yeah. is a, it, it's a really interesting. We haven't talked about this enough. So, um, uh, yeah. and and you know, we're always talking about the terrible thing that happened that caused this other thing, but the thing that didn't happen. How mm. Uh, mm. this is really um, uh, quite challenging for our our thinking. Absolutely. Yes. And it's all coming back to, you know, having that enriched environment in that early developmental stages of, uh, of neural development, getting that neural architecture happening yeah. um, within a, an enriched environment. And obviously in these, ne- these cases of emotional ne- neglect, um, those elements, some of those elements are missing. And so the, if we are talking about neuroscience, the, the neural architecture is, is wanting in some areas. Yes, and of course we don't know how much of that can can be substituted later on. Although I think there's evidence that quite a bit of it can. But mm, I would mm. say that you know the way that this this feels subjectively for the clients is is a sense that other people know stuff that they haven't been told, mm, right? And very basic stuff about how to do life. Mm, so that's mm. how, and a client of mine put it like that. It's like other people know what to do in life and I just don't nobody's told me yeah 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 so interesting now now what we what we do is I mean there's so much in there and I think we're at a point of great a great point of process we do find that uh, around about this time um, we've been going for about half an hour or so now that uh, people have have uh, tend to have what we found was they finished their commute or they finished their job but it's just as a concentration so we might Sort of wind things up, and the good thing is we do have this um, uh, this a uh, uh, little bit of more of an insight in the magazine, and then of course the book is there. Please go into the bookshops and Amazon and uh, all those various places and grab them. But is there is there something particular that we've we've missed that would be um, that's on your mind that would be useful to to add uh, just before we wind up? 
I guess I'm still slightly with the advice to therapists. So one of them is going to be um, assume you have a much more low functioning person than they look. Mm -hmm. Because that's what they'll do. It's part of what you do. If you're an ignored child, you try to look like there's nothing wrong with you. It's very important to do that. So don't be for therapists. The advice would be don't be fooled. See, mm. see a little bit beyond yeah. that and see how how fragile the whole presentation really is, and treat them like a very, you know, treat them like a very seriously traumatized person yeah. who's basically mm. living in a state of chronic burnout. Yeah, yeah. Because actually, Chronic they loss. haven't really quite got what it takes to do to live an ordinary life. Okay. And that wonderful, hopeful uh, message you had in there that um, although we can't be exactly sure on, on on a broad level, but fundamentally, there's a great opportunity and possibility for change, growth, and uh, and development oh, yeah. to some degree, that's and that's what's important. Okay. Yes. Fantastic. Well, we really appreciate you writing this book and uh, we'll encourage everyone to go mm -hmm. out and grab a copy. We'll leave a link in the show notes. So, Catherine, thank you so much for joining us here on the Science of Psychotherapy podcast. It was great talking. It was a very great pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, Catherine. <laughs>